Good morning, everyone. This is Sarah at Wasasa, and I just want to welcome you all to this morning's webinar on case file review, a collaborative approach. I do have Peter Fiala here with me, uh, and so if you have any tech issues, there is a chat box. Feel free to put in your questions there or your issues that you're having, and Peter can help you with that. Also, if you have any questions as the webinar is occurring, feel free to use the chat box as well. And uh, so again, I just want to thank you for joining us this morning, and I want to thank Jeff from also the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault for providing today's webinar for us. And with that being said, I'd like to hand it over to her right away here at 1030, right on time. Wow, we're on top of things today, Darlene. This is awesome. <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm so happy you can join us today. We're going to talk about case file review. Um, so let's just get started. And I'm going to have some tech problems. I think you have to bring it over. Thank you. OK. Um, without the funding, this project wouldn't be possible. So I just want to do a brief thank you to OVW for funding us on this project so we can um, really do some impactful work with SART teams. So thanks for the funding. <clears throat> um, so to start off, this is me. I'm Jess Van Eypern here. I am the project coordinator for the case review project that SBGI at Mincasa is doing. You will also see on the screen next to me is uh, Jim Pittenger. He is a retired law enforcement officer who does um, consultation with us in projects such as this one and other SART team projects. Um, I'm going to be presenting from the lens of being a SART coordinator. I, uh, before I came to work at the coalition, um, worked as a coordinator with a rural SART team in Minnesota for just shy of six years. So I'm going to bring that experience to this and kind of talk through that experience with you guys and how to kind of take on this project. Um, I really wanted to point out Jim <clears throat> as a partner to me on this project because I think that's one of the lessons I learned early on is you want to have someone from law enforcement involved in this process if you're going to be reviewing law enforcement case files. And I'm not just saying that. I've, I've learned that from law enforcement. Um, I was at a training last May and I was speaking with a law enforcement officer and they're presenting on auditing case files and I asked her, how, how do I make an uh, impact with law enforcement? How do I get them to hear me when I'm talking about some stuff we want to do? And the law enforcement officer said to me point blank, well, you have another law enforcement officer, tell us it. So I said, okay, and then and I was like, okay. So then I went to NSAC and I um, heard that same thing repeated from another law enforcement officer in Texas. So. The one thing I want to I want to give you is if you're wanting to do case file review and specifically looking to do law enforcement case files, get a law enforcement partner on this project because this can be a really big project. So get a partner that that um, is from the field that where you're going to be reviewing the case files. <clears throat> um, another thing too I want to mention, uh, like Darlene said, please chat in questions. I have um, our Leah Lutz, our SVGI manager, running the chat feature today. So if you have any questions, please chat them in. Um, I'm really more interested in you guys understanding what, what concepts we're trying to explore here versus me just talking and it not making sense. I want this to be digestible, so please ask any questions you want me to clarify. Um, at the end, there will be time for questions, um, and we'll, I think we'll unmute the phones so that you can ask some of those questions. Um, but please chat in as we go through. So what today's focus is really going to be about is what is case file review? Um, uh, we're going to talk about how to prepare for case file review, uh, facilitating that, that process, and then going through that process. And we're going to be sharing some tools that we have used um, to guide the team through that. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about some findings and recommendations. Um, myself, specifically, I started here at the Coalition back in 2015, and I led a team in Utah through um, reviewing case files. Um, but SVJ itself has reviewed case files with two other locations. So I'm going to be sharing stories from all, all three of those locations. Okay, next slide, please. And Peter, would you, would you uh, start the polling question? Um, I just want to know who's on the webinar with us today so I can try and tailor it to what, what your discipline is needing or perhaps wanting. So we'll take a moment for you guys to uh, begin polling. Okay, I think that should be, are we at a good amount of time for polling, Peter? I'm not sure that I'm seeing the, 
Technical difficulties, Peter. I'm not sure that I'm seeing the polling information. I'll just say it. We have um, okay. 25% start coordinator, zero okay. prosecutors, 50% advocates, 13% probation and corrections, and 13% law enforcement. Okay. What was the probation number? 13%. Okay. And then law enforcement. Okay. Wonderful. And I apologize that we only had those many um, polling options, but it seems like the the format is just that you can have up to five options. So great. Looks like we have a great mix. Um, we will go on to the next group. Okay, so I should probably tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, we are the Sexual Violence Justice Institute at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, our focus is really working with multidisciplinary teams um, and their allied professionals to really help them develop some tools. Um, we do trainings with them and, and resources that are that are based in a victim-centered response. Um, we're, we're not the experts in the communities. We go in with, with some best practices and we help that team kind of develop themselves for what's going to work best for what they have in their community. Um, we come from an advocacy standpoint because we are housed within the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, so we, we bring that victim-centered voice to our work. Um, we have about 12 teams in Minnesota that we provide direct support to. Um, through monthly calls and coordinator retreats, and then we do every other year a uh, National Institute for SART Leaders. Um, so that's really our work. And then we do a lot of connecting um, because a lot of teams are doing, are doing the systems change work, and so we're, what better place is to learn from other coordinators and see what's working and maybe what's not working. Um, so one thing I just want to mention for the SART coordinators that are on the call today, every, like I said, every other year we have a National Institute so in May of 2017, here in the metro area, the Twin City area, we're going to be holding a rich, uh, National Institute. Um, we do cap it at about 100 applicants or coordinators. So if it's something of interest to you, you know, get in your, um, your reservation as soon as we start putting it out there. Um, from my experience of being a coordinator, this was an invaluable experience because I got to talk with other coordinators and I got to understand different techniques they were trying to get movement with their team, um, different um, ways that their team was working, different, uh, different projects their teams were working on. It was, just, it was just an amazing experience to really learn from other coordinators. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, we'll be sending it, of course, to WCASA, our Wisconsin Coalition, um, and they'll, they'll get that information out to you as well. Okay. <clears throat> so let's get started and get into what we're really here about today. Um, I want to just clarify some terms for the purpose of this call. Um, in Minnesota, we call them SMART teams, Sexual Assault Multidisciplinary Action Response Teams. Um, they can be called SARTs. There can be, oh, there can be also CCRs, there can be MDTs, but for the purpose of this, I'm going to say SMART or SART, and that's what I'm meaning, this, the response team. Um, Within this project, we kind of have some sections that really apply to core team members. And so when I say core team members, I'm meaning these five disciplines here, law enforcement, medical, prosecution, advocacy. And then some teams have corrections or probations on their team. Um, that's something SVGI kind of really, um, you know, wants teams to think about including on their SART teams. And then also there's allied members. So some of your community-based members that might be on your team, which can include ministerial, they can include the college, they can include public health, adult protection, uh, marginalized communities, behavioral health, etc. cetera. Um, so that's what we're meaning when I say allied members. A few more words we need to cover. So when I say case file today, what I'm meaning is all the documents or the records that are accumulated in response to a sexual assault. When I'm saying case file review, <coughs> excuse me, I'm meaning the systematic process of examining case files and identifying compliance with or deviance from those established policies and protocols. Case file review can also include a determination of gaps and barriers to an effective response. I just want to be really clear about that because I think some teams talk about doing, I've had teams talk about doing uh, a case autopsy or case review and it's where the team is like presenting just some snippets of what happened in a case and it's like an hour and a half meeting and then, and then everyone just kind of takes what they can from it. 
But what I'm talking here is a systematic response of examining the files. Um, and then also for this, this today's presentation, it's really important to talk about closed cases. Today with that, I'm meaning where law enforcement has made an arrest in the case or has referred the case and the, the prosecutor has filed charges. Also, for the purposes of case file review, we include cases that law enforcement has made inactive with no immediate intent for follow-up, right? So that's, that's how we're defining case, closed cases. Okay, so on the next slide here, I, I want you guys to use the chat feature, and I really want you to just take a moment and think about what comes to mind when I ask you about doing a case file review with your SART. And I want you to write just one, one word for that. So I'll, I'll take a minute here and not, not talk and have you guys chat in the one word you think of when I say, do a case file review with your SART team. Okay, not everyone at once here. Oh, I got some. One said exhausting. Defensiveness. Oh, yes. Uh, evaluate. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have nervous. Yes, those, those are good words. Those are words I've heard time and time again. I will wait to see if we just get a few more here. I think we got to... Ooh, helpful, yes, I like that. The optimism, helpful, yes. Accountability, definitely. Educational, mm-hmm. Complicated, oh, yes. You get that one on the nose. <laughs> um, inaccurate, okay, yeah, definitely. Okay, wonderful. Um, so yeah, you guys are right in line with what I've heard when I've been to other states and in Minnesota here talking about this. Um, one word that also sticks out to me that people say is transparency. Um, their team members want transparency in this process. So these are important things to really keep in mind because I think if you're going to facilitate your team through this process, you need to keep in mind some of the concerns or thoughts that they have. And this might be an activity to start with your team just so you have an understanding of where they're coming from. Someone had mentioned evaluati evaluative, and that's really important because that's one thing that we really look at here at SVGI is we talk about evaluation, and it's coming from the sense of curiosity, and we really see case file review to fit into that evaluation standpoint. Um, so it's really important to really bring that through with your team. So thank you. Okay. So we should talk a little bit about why SVGI got into doing case file review, and it really comes down to what the national context of case file review was in the early 2000s, or the aughts, as, as people say. Um, there was a lot of um, national exposés coming out. Um, for those of you who, who maybe remember, uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore Sun, uh, Cleveland, Los Angeles, New Orleans, um, uh, Missoula, Montana, all of these places were coming out with uh, outcry about the no high number of unfounded sexual assault cases, um, in some cases where they weren't even being investigated or looked at, which prompted um, some lovely, lovely DOJ investigations, perhaps, in some of those sites. Um, and so that made us really think, wow, this is, this is interesting. All this going, is going on. And we also found out in all these locations there were SART teams in place. And we really got curious about that gap. Right? Because we come from the standpoint of wanting to um, work in the criminal justice system and make changes that are, that are beneficial for the victims and for the responders. Um, and also, this is a, kind of one of those number one areas where we receive technical assistance calls from. So we really needed to, to go in and take a deep dive into this and, and do some work. So that's part of what got us started. But also, um, sexual assault cases are some of the most complex um, cases that are investigated by law enforcement and prosecuted by prosecutors. And unfortunately, our combined efforts still demonstrate relatively poor results in holding those sex offenders accountable for their crimes. 
of the small percentage of sexual assault cases that are reported to law enforcement, like it says here, research estimates that only 7 to 27 percent eventually result in charges being filed, and only 3 to 26 percent of those lead to some type of conviction. And from my experience as being an advocate, these are not good numbers for a victim that wants to go forward that's sitting in my office when I was an advocate, talking through whether they want to report or not, you know. So it made us think we really need to start looking at how can we, how can we make a change to this. Um, interestingly, a significant but often overlooked part of the criminal justice system's response um, is the doc documentation of a victim's report and the sexual assault investigation. And these documents reflect the extent of an investigation and are often the prosecutor's first introduction to the victim's account, the suspect's account, if there is one, and the other evidence that's gathered in these cases. And oftentimes, based on these documents alone, a prosecutor is going to decide whether they're going to prosecute that reported crime. And unfortunately, you guys, crucial context of force, coercion, offender behavior, and other evidence is too often buried in these reports, perhaps lost in the handoff during the between the responders during the course of the investigation. And that's why these documents are so powerful and so significant. So again, that made SVGI go, hmm, we should start taking a look at this and we should really learn something here. Um, so but for, for those of you on the call or on the webinar that are big picture thinkers, this is kind of going to give you a concept of what we're thinking with case file review. Um, and then for those that want more of the details, I'm going to get into the details in a little bit. Um, so what we see with case file review, review is that victim advocacy is at the center of, of, of the target of what we're trying to do. Um, they're going to be present, hopefully, in all of the response for the sexual assault within the criminal justice system and, and in the wider community. So in the context of case file review, the advocacy response is at the heart of, of the case, but it's not a complete case. Um, prosecution is going to have the most complete case, right? But what you're going to learn from reviewing these case files, either law enforcement or prosecution, you're going to learn, did advocacy respond when they were contacted? Uh, did they participate appropriately? You know, like during the interview, were they interrupting the law enforcement officer or were they listening? Um, were they maintaining contact with the victim throughout the, throughout the criminal justice process as, as is documented in the case file? Um, medical, you're going to see if they um, maybe considered the needs of the victim and how, how they bring them in for an exam, if they're in a private waiting room, if they can do that, or if it's more kind of like a catacall kind of a thing, you know. Um, how do they explain their procedures to the victim? That might be documented in the files. Um, do they refer to advocacy, if that's something that the victim is wanting? You're also going to learn a little bit about law enforcement, about their response, if they believe the victim, if they considered uh, the victim's needs in their timing of the interview, um, if they kept the victim informed. You're also going to learn a little bit maybe about prosecution, about their response, you know, and also if they kept the victim informed and what was happening. So you can choose what type of case file you want to review. What SVGI has done is we've reviewed prosecution case files and we've reviewed law enforcement case files. Um, but there, there needs to be parameters in place to do that, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. Next slide, please. Okay, so case file review process. What it is, is it's, it's describing the actual response to the sexual assault case, right? It's identifying maybe some gaps in the response. It's also, though, identifying the positive aspects of the response. Um, if, if you're coordinating a team and leading them through this, it's really important to identify some of the good things that are happening, um, especially when you're reviewing someone else's work. Um, you want to emphasize like, the importance of these police reports. They're going to capture the victim's experience. They're going to communicate the dynamics of the incident, and they're going to also inform the perceptions and decisions of next responders. I can't tell you, um, there's been a couple times we found in reports where an officer has documented, you know, I don't believe this victim, I don't believe this happened, and that can be really detrimental to the next person reading that case file. So you want to be, you want to be cognizant and aware of that. Um, what case file review is not, um, there you go, it's, it's not an, an evaluation of an individual performance or the overall performance of a specific agency. So you really want to be able to say to people, you know, this is not looking at just one individual agency. We're going to learn, like I showed in that in that target previously. You're going to learn about every every response. 
Um, it's not a, a discussion of disagreements of policy and practice. That's, that should be done at another time. If you have a concern with a team member's policy or practice, that needs to be handled more one-on-one. -on -one. This is not a way to bring that up with the entire team. And it's, and it's not negative feedback, right? You have to kind of go into this from a standpoint of curiosity and understanding. Um, what we found for reasons why teams do case file review is really to evaluate the current policies and practices of the SART agencies. So what is working? Is the policies that we drafted a few years ago and put on paper doing what we thought they would do? Or is it like one of those situations where you write something down, you think it's good to go, and then it actually comes to fruition completely opposite of what you thought? Um, another reason why teams do case file review is really to identify and, and implement strategies for sexual assault cases to be more successfully investigated, right? Um, there might be one of the sites that we were working with, um, it, the recommendation was looking at more suspect exams to corroborate um, what the victim, the, the victim is saying and also maybe a little bit find out more where perhaps the suspect is lying or not. And so that was something that was really key for one of the sites is they're like, that is really helpful. Like we need to start bringing in suspect exams because we think that's going to really help us get more of what we're looking for. Um, and it's also just a way to create more resources um, that will assist officers in the investigation and in the report writing. In one of our sites, they're now looking into um, they're looking into uh, an electronic device like an app that prompts them for certain questions when the initial responder goes to a sexual assault um, initial response to work with a victim. It prompts them for some questions that they need to be asking just to kind of get the basics um, to to give that on to the investigator. So some really great um, tools have come out of this of this project. Um, yeah. Okay. So more reasons why teams do case file review. Um, really to develop their protocols. Some some agencies want to do case file review and they haven't written a protocol yet. And I, I'm somewhat hesitant about telling them to do case file review, but yet I'm somewhat not because it might make you think okay, we need to actually get a protocol in place for doing this. Um, in one of the sites we did that, they didn't have any protocols in, in place. They did it and they go, I understand why we need to have a protocol in place. And also, one of the prosecuting attorneys said, okay, I really need to be a part of this SART team. They're doing some great work. So it was really the impetus to get that team going on writing some protocols and doing some great work together. Um, teams also do case file review just to pinpoint areas that they can improve which you know, hopefully likely will lead to pro increased prosecution rates for victims that are they're willing to go through the criminal justice system. Um, and just also another reason why teams are doing case file review is really to take advantage of the heightened awareness regarding sexual violence right now. So let's talk a little bit about the history of what we've done. Um, in 2011, SVGI started doing case file review with one of our smart teams in Rice County. Um, and then in 2013, 13, uh, the chief of police for the Hastings Police Department, who we've done some work with, came to us and said, let's, let's do an entire audit of my sexual assault investigations here, because um, I want to know what's working, what's not. And then in 2015, we went to Tooele, Utah, and worked with the Tooele SART team. Um, our SART also came working with Praxis International, who um, does audits of domestic violence cases. And so back in 2011, we did a lot of work with them um, starting what that process would look for, like for sexual assault investigations. So let me go into these just a little bit more specifically. So for example, in Rice County, Minnesota, um, which is just south of the Twin City metro area, um, we did a case file review with their SMART team. So it was in collaboration with us. Um, the presumption in this situation was that the individual responses were based on system-wide patterns. Um, that individuals were basically responding based on their protocol and some of those times it was working and some of those times it just really wasn't. The focus of this assessment or this case file reveal was, review was really on how victim safety and offender accountability were affected by the established practices. So what did that look like? Um, an example of that was you know, when does the victim, one of the questions they asked while reviewing the case files is when does the victim experience um, concern or when does the victim not feel safe? Um, and what they found is when the victim goes from reporting 
the law enforcement. They have uh, the community-based advocate working with them. The law enforcement sends the case to prosecution to make decision charges or you know charging decisions. There would be months where the victim would not hear anything, um, and so that was something that really stuck out in the case file review. And so that was that was kind of an easy fix for that team to be like, okay, we need to get our system-based advocate connecting with that victim so they know what's going on in their case, so they kind of know things are things are here. Yeah, maybe they're 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 staying still for a little bit but they're here and we have your case file, right? Um, so I'm going to be talking about that a little bit. It's really important when you're doing case file review to figure out what your focus is. What are you really looking to do some work with? And I imagine if you're on this, this webinar, you have some thoughts about what your team wants to review. Um, so it's really important as a coordinator to make sure the team is always focused on what they're, what they're working for or what they're, what they're trying to focus on and get accomplished. Because um, if you don't, that can cause some problems. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Also in Rice County, they reviewed 20 case files. Um, they did that over the course of monthly meetings. Um, and they actually, this one, they actually looked at prosecution case, prosecution case files. And that also included a law enforcement investigative report. So this is the one that kind of looked at both of them. And when I say internal review, I'm meaning the SART and the SART members looked at the, the case files, and it was only those core team members like I talked about earlier, so medical, prosecution, probation, advocacy, and law enforcement was involved in that review. Okay, next. Then we had Hastings, Minnesota. Like I said, the police chief wanted us to take a look at their agency response um, and kind of audit what was going on. There was a presumption that the way in which investigations were documented had a direct effect on prosecution decisions. So they wondered if they looked at um, how their case files were being documented and if they had a way to maybe change those and make those better, um, better show what was going on, you know, like that offender coercion and force, that might help with, with the prosecution um, moving forward on some cases. This was more of a really in-depth audit um, so they did ride-alongs with law enforcement officers. They had scheduled interviews um, with, with the officers. They reviewed all of their uh, statistics and assessed, um, you know, were, were sexual assault all cases being coded as sexual assaults or was um, a disorderly, if you looked at it, you found out more that it was actually um, a sexual assault case. Um, so it was a real 360-degree look. Um, this really kind of mimicked more of what Praxis International does with their audits with domestic violence cases. Um, and in this case, we considered it an external review because the Hastings, Minnesota, Dakota County area did not have, does not have a SART or SMART team. So we brought in reviewers from um, the International Association of Forensic, Forensic Nurses, so IAFN. Um, we also brought in some reviewers from Equitas, the prosecutor's resource. And then we had some Minnesota law enforcement officers that came in, along with SVGI at Mincasa advocacy staff that, that reviewed these case files. Okay. Um, and then Tooele, Utah. This was a collaboration, again, with SVGI and the SART team there. Um, the presumption was that sexual assault reports not document the totality of the victim experience. And so our focus was really on the depth and scope of the documentation that was created by law enforcement in the reviews, um, and this was an internal review where it was the SART team uh, doing the review because they had a SART team, but we also brought in IAFN again and Equitas and some uh, law enforcement consultants as well. And one thing I want to mention uh, with the Hastings example, they reviewed uh, roughly 45 law enforcement sexual assault cases. In Tooele, Utah, we reviewed 25 sexual assault law enforcement cases. So what I want to show you here is that you guys can develop your, your review process. You can go as in deep as Hastings, Minnesota was, where it was that in-depth audit of a single agency's policies and practices, you know, the evaluating the crime statistics, the identification, identification of the current best practices, um, the interviewing of the staff, the responders, they also did what we call a mapping, where you map what the current response would be to a hypothetical sexual assault situation. Um, and then they brought in external reviewers to 
look through the case files and give some input for what they saw. You could do more with Rice County, um, where they reviewed law enforcement and prosecution case files, and they also did a mapping exercise to kind of get an idea of what the case or what the response is like. Um, and they brought in their SART team and they reviewed the case files. Or you can do one that's more like Tooele, which was again internal, very similar to Rice County, but it was just looking specifically at the law enforcement cases. So the scalability of case file review is kind of open to what you find um, is your team can actually do and what, what you have the time for. Um, I want to also mention in all three of these sites, there was some training on some best practices like I've kind of mentioned, um, specifically in Rice County before we did the review there. We had all the team members go online to the uh, End Violence Against Women International website. They have an online training tool. And we had them do a course that talked about um, non-consensual sex in, uh, in, in law enforcement investigations and how using uh, the language of the victim or quotations of what the victim has said can be impactful in case files or in reports. So we did that in Rice County, um, and we looked at that, a very similar thing in Tooele where we had Equitas and IFN and law enforcement really present on that information. Okay. So is your team ready? So one way to kind of really look at if your team's ready to take on case file review is, has your team created some protocols for responding to sexual assault? Have they gone through and really looked at how are we going to negotiate how this response is going to look? Have they had some tough conversations? Because reviewing case files um, can create some tough conversations, I guess, to say the least. Um, so we, f we recommend teams that have protocols in place. This might be a next step for them. But I don't want to diminish the fact that you could still do this if you don't have a protocol in place. Um, you just need to realize you're going to have to do some relationship building, I think, um, if it's not there to talk about some difficult things and, and set some ground, ground rules or guidelines for how you're going to talk about them. Um, also, do you have a strong law enforcement and prosecution representation on your team? Like I said early on, I had to have a partner in law enforcement to help me go through this. This, this project, and so are they, you know, are they bought into doing this, um, and are they really active on the team, then that, that's great, and this would be a great opportunity to really do some investigation into the response. Um, does your team have an, a mechanism for discussing issues related to protocol and practice? So it's kind of like before, have you talked through some, some difficult things? Um, with the Rice County team, they were really looking at how do they look internally because they've done all this work creating protocols and doing um, hearing from victims and doing community engagement events. They wanted to know what can we do though to improve our response as, re as all of us responding to victims of sexual assault. So they really prompted we want to look internally. So that you know kind of says to you, yep, the team's ready. Also you want to know does your team have a significant number of cases? You know, in some communities they're very rural and they don't have a lot of cases or they shouldn't have a lot of victims coming forward and reporting. Um, so you want to have like a critical mass number that says, okay, we can get some, some themes, right, um, from this. And so, like I said before, the smallest we've done is 20 case files, and we definitely got some themes from that. Okay, so continuing on kind of with assessing the interest in case file review, you really need to get clear on your focus of why does your team want to do case file review. If you're leading your team through this, you're going to have to come back to this because sometimes we get distracted on CERT teams and so you really need to bring it back to what is our focus and you need to iron that out. Um, so like I said before with the Rice team, they were looking at victim safety offender accountability. So they wanted to know is their protocol working and they found out when victims experience silence in their case, they don't feel safe, they aren't safe. Um, so uh, that was a focus. Another focus could be like, again, just looking at what type of language is used in the police reports. Um, so you, I'm sure you all have your own thoughts in your, in your minds as well about what maybe would be a focus. Um, you also need to remember what it feels like to be reviewed. I think we've all probably been through review experiences that are uncomfortable. So we need to make sure we keep that in mind. Um, and one thing that we did in a couple of these sites is we always touched base with with the agency that was being reviewed, specifically law enforcement and a few of them in prosecution, just to see if they had any concerns, if 
um, with the law enforcement that I was working with, we would we'd call and touch base, and they kind of let us know some of the conversations that were happening um, to kind of figure out, okay, where do we need to pay attention to, right? Because this is supposed to be like a team building activity. We don't want this to destroy the team. We want people to learn from this and have it be um, a somewhat enjoyable experience. I hate to say that, but um, it, it was really helpful to do that. And, and actually, in some of the sites, when we call and talk with the law enforcement, um, it's funny because some of the law enforcement would come in and talk with the coordinators and just say, you know, I, I hear you're doing this case file review process, and there's that one case that I really, I'm really upset that didn't go forward. Do you think you can make sure that makes it into your pile of reviews? So if law enforcement started getting excited, excited about this, which was really awesome, um, because there's a lot of great things that we can learn. So you really have to tie it back to the evaluation of the entire system. You are going to look at one set of case files, but you're going to learn so much about the entire response for victims. Um, and, and like I said, I can't say it enough. You need to find out what the focus is for why you're doing case file review. So it's a great conversation to have with your team, because if they lose that focus, I've heard that's another teams have gotten sidetracked, they start blaming each other or a member, another agency, and, and then it's just really hard to keep a healthy, positive team going forward. Okay, so um, I'm surprised I didn't hear a one word of, of confidentiality from, from you folks, because that seems to be, when I was a coordinator, it always scared the crap out of me that we were going to break some confidentiality for a victim, like I, I didn't want to do any more harm. And so one of the things that we've done as we have this team agreement form here, and I know you can't read it very well, and I apologize, um, that really kind of identifies the, the uses of, uh, of the documents that are being shared. So, for example, in one of the points, it talks about the case files will be brought in by SVG at Mincasa. They'll be reviewed, and at the end of the day, all the information will be collected and given back to SVG at Mincasa. Um, conversations about the case files will be in the case file review room at the review room at the time that they're reviewing and they're not going to happen outside of outside of this outside of this area where we're reviewing the case files. Um, and, and team members are not authorized to release or discuss any of the details of the cases or information outside or with anyone else. Um, and there's another one about um, and it also kind of sets a guideline for what is the intention of, of this project. It, it's really for to inform project staff and stakeholders about some themes that are happening in the current response. So this was kind of a layer for us to kind of ensure some confidentiality. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more because this, this is not enough, but this was something that we thought really made people draw attention to um, what you can and can't do and kind of set some boundaries and some guidelines in, in this process. Um, so we'll go to the next slide and I'll, I'll talk about confidentiality, confidentiality a little bit more here in the future. Um, when you're reviewing case file review or case files, you need to uh, kind of figure out what piece of the pie do you want to look at. Um, you need to look at, um, so like what type of sexual assault case do you want to investigate or do you want to dig into? Um, this was something that where we really talked with the law enforcement to find out well, what do you guys want to know more about because when you're really talking about this project with them, you also want them to get some information out of it. So in one of our sites, they're like, we really want to know about the non-stranger sexual, sexual assaults because I feel like that's what we struggle the most with. So we made sure when we were selecting the case files, we only selected cases that looked at non-stranger sexual assaults. Um, you can look at, maybe you want to look at alcohol facilitated sexual assaults or campus sexual assaults or, um, you know, whatever it is that you really want to look at. It's a great conversation to have with your team. Um, you need to talk about how many you're going to do, like I said earlier, and you're going to talk about who's supplying the case files, who's willing to do this. Um, and then the case status, you want to look at that as well. Like I said earlier on, we looked at closed cases, um, but some teams are looking at open case management, um, but that's not something we've done a lot of. So what I have up here on the screen is um, the What Can We Talk About, a guidebook for how sexual assault response response teams discuss these cases. The link on this website here, or the link on here, takes you directly to that. So that's a great resource that you can look at to kind of start this process. Um, I am, we are in the process of developing a toolkit for leading your team through case file review, but if you want something to get you started, that's a great option for you. Um, yeah, next slide. 
And then one thing really important, if you're coordinating your team through this, you really need to identify what some of the agency concerns are when you're meeting with your team. Let's say you've decided we want to do case file review. Um, here we go. Now you need to hear, you're starting to talk about confidentiality, you're starting to set your guidelines for what, what you are going to do in this project. Um, you want to maybe meet with discipline-specific small groups. We did this in one of the sites and really asked, what are your concerns based on your discipline of doing this? Um, and then if they were willing, we had them present that to the entire team because it really helped them understand um, some, of the, some of the nuances to their response. Um, some, some team members weren't comfortable responding and presenting that information, but for myself as, as the coordinator of the project, it was really helpful for me to know. So specifically, excuse me, one of the law enforcement groups said, um, I respond the way I was trained, um, and, and I'm worried that people are going to think that I'm not you know, responding the best that I can do, but I'm going to do what I was trained to do. And so one, and that kind of that, that onus was on them and they felt you know, like they weren't doing enough. And so we ended up talking with the chief in one of the sites and before we began the review, we had him come in and talk about how this review is important for him because he's going to learn what's going on. And it's not on his law enforcement officers, it's on him because he trained them to respond how they are. So he wanted to, you know, it kind of took that weight off the law enforcement's shoulders um, for those that really had that concern. So it was really helpful to identify those agency concerns um, and, then, and then do what you need to do to, to accommodate what's going on there. Okay, so on the next slide here, what I want to ask you guys is just to take a minute um, and from your discipline, I want you to kind of write down what concerns you about doing a case file review. And then if a few of you could chat that in, that would be really helpful because we can share that with everyone. So again, write down what concerns you about doing a case file review from your specific discipline. Okay, while we're, while we're waiting for a few of those chats to come in, um, there was a question someone asked about, do you use the victim's name, name in the case file review? And I'm going to get to that in just a minute, but no, we do not use the victim's name in the case file review. We'll talk a little bit about redaction, but just to answer your question. We got a few coming in here. Um, one is saying, from the standpoint of advocacy, um, confidentiality, the victim experience should be first and foremost. Yep, definitely from the advocacy lens, that that is the concern. And I did hear a couple teams talking about if, from advocacy standpoint, if people were to figure out who was in who the victim was in the case file, to be respectful and not share any um, any identifying information, which also is important, especially for funding. Um, looks like someone wrote in maintain relationships, and I think that could, I didn't write what discipline they're from, but I think that's really important for, for all disciplines is you want to be able to maintain your relationships, but you need to be able to talk through this process because there's so much great you can learn from it. Um, I am concerned, another, another comment, um, I am concerned about proper documentation organization of the files and whether someone could pick up the file and determine what happened in the case easily and why decisions were made. Yeah, I can. I think I can understand that concern. I'm not quite sure, yeah, if people don't, if there's not proper rent documentation, so you want to make sure that that's happening. Yep, and people sometimes make assumptions about why a decision was made. You know, in one of the sites, this, like, that's, I'm going to get this a little bit, but that's kind of where the magic happens. Okay, I facilitate a case file reveal already, but one concern we have is how to disseminate our findings. Oh, that's a great question. Um, 
I'm going to talk about that too in just a little bit. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so this is a concern from a multidisciplinary team. I'm not sure what that was in relationship to. OK, so let's go back up just a minute. OK. OK. Yep, so the disseminating of the findings definitely is a concern. And one of the sites, I'm just going to answer that, and one of the sites, what we did is we, um, the SVGI wrote up the uh, findings and recommendations and then brought them back to the law enforcement agency because when we started this project, um, we really asked them how they want the information to come and they said we'd like it to come to us first so we can understand it you know, and, and work through it. And then what happened was the chief then presented the findings to the entire SART team that we had recommended based on best practices and what the team found in the case file review. And that went over pretty well. Um, and, and that's also what we did in a few other sites. So that's kind of how we approached that. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Um, so, so I addressed some of the ways that these concerns could be addressed, but I'm sure you guys can think of a few on your own. But I think it's really good to start thinking through what are the concerns that different agency members are going to have, um, because you have to be cognizant of those and, and take time for that. Um, and or create avenues for those team members to come to you and talk through what it is that they're, they're concerned about. Because you can be all gung-ho and want to do this, and then you don't have people on board. That can be really damaging. Um, I once had a team member say to me, well, if we just review law enforcement case files and then later tell them the results of what we found, that should be okay, right? And I said, no, no, if you want to burn bridges, that then do that, but um, you, you need to make sure that everyone's kind of on board and where they're at in this process before you start going forward. Okay, so let's talk about preparing the case files for review because we're going to get into confidentiality and we're going to get into um, redaction in that. So um, case file review can be fitted to whatever your team is hoping to accomplish. Um, so like I said, you know, different different outcomes we're looking for with the different agencies. With Rice and with Tooele, we looked at multidisciplinary reviews of those cases. In Hastings, we looked at a really in-depth review of all that was happening in sexual assault in their, in their world. Um, so you need to know that the level of information needed for any purpose changes. So at a minimum, you're probably going to need policies and protocols. What are the, so which means, what are the responders told to do? You're going to want a map the existing system, like I said before, you have a scenario like a, we write like a maybe three sentence scenario of Sheila was out having, well, I just use that name because that's what we use, um, Sheila was out having drinks with friends, met a guy, went home, he sexually assaulted her or raped her. Um, and then you have your teams write down what is going to happen from that point on. How is an advocacy going to get involved? Um, how might law enforcement get involved if she decides to report? Right? So that really kind of helps you outline what happens. And you want to make sure that your team answers what happens versus what they hope happens. Because that can be a common uh, fallacy of a team is they start to say, well, this is what we, we ideally want to happen. But that's, that's just not how it is. You know, On my team, when I was a coordinator, we did the mapping, and it got kind of messy all over the place. And that's the point of it, because we don't always have the best response, and we need to see where we're starting from. Um, you can also do staff interviews if you want to go there, um, or responder surveys, which I think are very informative. You can even go into process mapping, which, you know, they did that actually in Hastings where you went through the process that law enforcement takes when a call comes in for a sexual assault um, and how they respond and how they dispatch and how um, the uh, patrol officer responds. and It's just the entire process. That's a lot more detailed. So you can pick where you start. Um, another option might be looking at just what's all in law enforcement case files. Um, it might be having your law enforcement officer run the team through what information they gather and having a conversation about what, what the purpose is of all of those and just understanding, just understanding it because not everyone understands law enforcement case files. In, in the times that I've presented on this and asked advocacy, a lot of times they don't really know all the content of a case file, and so this can be a really good opportunity for informa information sharing and understanding of 
what each team member goes through in their response. Um, also, you know, in one of the sites that we started talking about the case files, um, the prosecution started talking about, you know, having pictures in their in their case files, and um, I believe one of the same nurses said, "Well, why do you have pictures in there?" And I said, "Well, we need them for the for the entire the totality of the of the uh, sexual assault." And they said, "Yeah, but you probably don't even know what the zoomed-in picture of this micro." abrasion is, so I don't know that you should be having those photos in your case files. So that led to a really interesting discussion about how one agency is holding the photos and, and how one agency says, no, that's not what we see as best practice. So it could be just a simple start of having law enforcement present to the team um, what all they have in their case files. Um, because one thing that really became apparent in doing this project in, in many of the sites is there's a big difference between what's in the narrative from law enforcement and what is actually in a transcribed interview. Um, so just kind of some food for thought. Uh, next up, confidentiality concerns. So this, yeah, this, this is the one that for me when I was a coordinator scared, really, really scared me to be honest because I just, I didn't want to, to cross some boundaries that, that could be, you can't unring that bell kind of a deal. Um, so you really need to talk about with your team, what are some applicable data privacy statutes and laws that are important to your jurisdiction? You know, I know what happens in Minnesota, but I couldn't tell you about Wisconsin and other states that well. Um, you also want to talk about your funding restrictions. What does the Violence Against Women Act say you can or can't share, or VOCA say you can or can't share? So with VAWA, you can't share personally identifying information, so that really tells you we can't see victims' names and addresses and all that information. Um, you also want to talk about your confidentiality statutes, uh, your advocate's privilege and privacy. It is great when advocates can explain that to the room because sometimes law enforcement, I had in my experience, would sit there and say, well, why aren't you telling me anything about this case? Is I'm telling you information that I have going on. And I'm like, I can't as an advocate. Um, and some know that and some don't, you know. So it's great conversations to have. You also want your prosecutor to talk about Brady versus Maryland and how that could apply. Like I said earlier, we're looking at closed cases, so it really shouldn't be applicable, but it's really a good conversation to have so everyone understands how that applies in the situation. Um, you want to talk about any agency policies or practices or anyone's licensing, licensure that might you know, have an impact on this. You know, immediately I think of uh, social workers and their code of ethics. You know, how does that apply to reviewing case files, um, if you decide to go outside the core members. Um, SVGI really recommends looking at just the core team members doing the case file review, but some teams want to look broader. Um, so then you need to really start including other licensures that might apply. And then any state or federal laws regarding information sharing, you might even want to talk about mandated reporting a bit, which might go down kind of a rabbit hole but it's something that you might want to bring to the table and have a conversation about. And the thing is you really want to prepare your team for that they're going to have these conversations so that they're, they're ready and willing to share maybe any handouts they have um, to really inform the team because if you do all this work in the beginning, it really develops the relationships so that later on, like someone had said, you're, you know, you're worried that you're going to you know, destroy some relationships in the process. But when you start having these conversations and information sharing and people are learning from each other and naturally builds the relationships there. Okay, so next up we have redaction of information. So with all that said, we redacted everything. <laughs> um, I, no, I'm somewhat joking. We redacted a lot. Because as I said earlier, evaluation is the key here. So we redacted the victim's name and their address and date of birth and all that. Uh, we redacted we redacted the suspect's name and address, and we did that because we didn't want um, people saying, oh, they're from that family, what, what do you expect, or something horrible like that. Because, again, the purpose of this is evaluation. It's not, um, it's not to place blame. It's to understand what's working, what's not. Um, we redacted witness names and addresses information. Uh, we redacted the responding officer name and their badge number. Because again, we're not looking at the officer specifically, we're looking at how is the system responding. We looked at the, ad we redacted the advocate name, um, and, and we also redacted the sexual assault nurse examiner. Um, so again, um, I know that gets hard, because you have like instead you put victim, victim one if there's a couple of victims in a, in a report, or uh, victim, suspect, uh, witness one, witness two, 
Officer 1, Officer 2, um, but there's ways to do that because, again, we're looking at the, at the system, at the totality. So facilitating, facilitating the case file review process, you have a couple options here. Um, you can do it internally and have your coordinator and maybe a law enforcement officer lead the team through this process. Um, or you can bring in an external resource, maybe someone from the coalition or you could reach out to us at SVG at Mincasa as well because that's something we could do as well. Um, there's pros and cons to both, but it's something to think about. Um, the internal one, you know, you have coordinators that know the team, right? Um, a, 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 a possible detriment could be the to that could be they have these preconceived ideas about um, why teams are being reviewed or what they want to look for and that might make it hard to really um, step back and have just a you know a sense of curiosity for this it might be harder to maintain the confidentiality because they know maybe a little bit more and it might not be um, and they might also be seen as as wanting to pursue pursue a particular agenda I know if I would have done this with my team um, I would have been seen as like this is what Joss wants to do and this is why. Um, so it would have been good for me to step back. Um, also, I just don't feel like I could lead my team through it at the time. Um, but if you bring in a, a, a counterpart or someone to help you facilitate through it, it's, it's a definite possibility. Um, another option, like I said, is the external reviewers because they might be seen more as impartial um, and don't have really com some preconceived ideas about the team but they also might not understand the dynamics of the team and what, what needs to be attended to. Um, so you have options, just know that. And, and as, as a TA provider, you can always, always please reach out to me for questions or anyone here at SVGI and we can kind of work with you through this, pro this process. Again, a toolkit's coming that's gonna talk through this a little bit more, um, but I just wanted to get you thinking about that as well. All right, so now we're gonna get into the tools that we used. So your team has talked about confidentiality, they've decided they want to review case files, they've figured out what their focus was, they mapped a response that a, 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 or a, a scenario that you created, you have all this information, now you're going to do the actual review. This here is the first tool that we use. Um, we give it to each person that's reviewing a case file, so they get a case file and they get this form and we call it the individual observation form. Um, and in this, we have four specific areas that we're looking at. Um, the initial response, we look at the victim's in-depth interview, um, we look at the suspect interview, and then we look at the evidence that's collected. And just a little information about this tool, um, this was created through our process back in 2011 and 2013 for kind of some, some of the commonly accepted best practices in sexual assault investigations. Um, and it, uh, we looked at the uh, International Association of Chiefs of Police information. Um, we looked at um, a couple of policies within the teams that we're reviewing, you know, um, to make sure that these bullet points really, Im really reflect what we're looking for for what's happening as far as best practices. Um, it's designed as a guide to use when you're reviewing case files, but not restrict the reviewer. So, um, if you go to the next uh, slide, Leah. Um, this really gives you a better vision of it. So, so that first box is that initial response. So you have advocacy offered or engaged. So were they offered or engaged? Um, one thing that you know you learn as you, as you go, and in hindsight, I, I really should have articulated this more. Um, a yes doesn't really tell me much. Um, a yes says yes, they were offered. Great. Okay, your protocol says they need to be offered within so many hours of a call coming into dispatch. Does that tell me anything? No, that just tells me they're offered. So you want to be clear if you use this tool that people need to really give you as much as they can, maybe give you some examples behind it. Um, and some of that really sparked a tool that we have kind of in the works. So this is that initial observation form. It has four sections on the front, and then on the back, the next two pages, it has six more overall questions. Um, to what extent? Does the documentation capture the full context of the crime or the sexual assault? It also asks to what extent is the process used by um, the police department, their timing, their interview contact or content, their follow-up, their handoffs, did that support a su successful case outcome? Um, to what extent do we see a victim-centered response? To what extent is the report organized for clear communication of the case to the reader? 
Um, and then it talks about the role of the victim and the role of the suspect. And I apologize, it's not all on there. Um, this is into OVW for approval, so I don't have it quite yet to share. Um, so far, things look good, but um, that, this will be coming out in the toolkit. So I, I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail for, for folks that maybe this is too much or, um, yeah. So that's, that's the first form that each individual person fills out. Then they are in, we have um, them in small groups, and they, so a small group of the mini, of the SART. So you want to have a law enforcement officer, you want to have a medical person, uh, prosecution, probation, advocacy. And then they bring their individual observation forms, and they sit down and they answer this team finding form. And it, right here it says response area in the blue there. Underneath it, it says initial response. So the initial response um, coordinates with the initial response from the observation form. And the first column says what was done well in this area. The second column talks about what can be approved upon. And the third column, recommendations related to this area. So the team, this, I have to tell you, this is kind of where the magic happens in case file review because the team starts having some really great conversations. And for those people, law enforcement or prosecution that can maybe share a little bit more, after a case is closed, it really ties or kind of fills in the blanks that maybe are missed um, when the case went through because people don't quite understand the entire context of, of why prosecution made the decision they did. So this is, this is really, like I said, this is where after we did this in one of the sites, I kind of asked, you know, how is this for you? Like, what, what would you say of doing case file review? And one team member said, this is where the, this was bridge building for me. This is where I learned so much about what law enforcement has to do in an investigation, what prosecution has to look through. Um, it just, it really filled in a lot for me. So this is a really great question, a great area for some awesome stuff to happen. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. It says, how do you decide who is at the table for the case review? And how do you make sure the group doesn't get too big? Who decides? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, when we were going in, can you just leave that up? When we were going in and doing this, we went in with the, um, the idea that it was just going to be the core disciplines who was going to be at the table reviewing the cases because we felt like that was another way to protect the confidentiality of the victim. Even though we redacted all the information, we felt like the less eyes on the cases, the better. Um, and to that point, um, let's say we were reviewing 20 cases and we had two little mini starts. Um, each one got 10 case files, so not everyone got to see all the case files. They all took a section. Um, yeah, because if the group gets too big, that's kind of hard. And I think that's kind of where you have as the coordinator kind of, um, you kind of ask people about it, you see where people are at, and then you can really just blame it on SVGI and say that's kind of what they see as the best practice. Do you know what I mean? Because um, one thing I heard, we had a law enforcement advisory group in this project, and one of the law enforcement officers from one our initial site in Rice County said they spent a lot of time afterwards talking with people about why law enforcement responds the way they do, which that's valid and, and they're fine doing that, but it took a lot more time. So it might be that your budget restrictions are we can only do this work for so many months or a year, therefore we need to get through this a little bit more quickly and you can say we'll review the case files but we'll bring you guys what we find right, the report that we write up, all the themes that we've identified. So that might be a way to, to, to get through that. I mean, it, I don't know, if the person asked this question, I don't know if your team can make decisions or come to consensus pretty easily or not. So it can be something you can post the group or it can be something that maybe as a coordinator you can say, we're going to go this route because that's what other, what we're seeing happening in the field. So long answer, but here we go. Okay, so next up. Um, like I said, that so this is just a zoomed in photo of, of that initial response of you know what the team's going to do together, and it, it mimics the observation form that I showed you before. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one thing I want to point out is after each day of reviewing case files, um, we would have the SART come back together. If you had a couple different little mini SARTs, multidisciplinary groups, we'd have them come back and they'd present their themes that they were finding. Um, let's say they reviewed as a group five case files. They would say if there's any themes that they found in, in the review. And in one of the sites, it became really clear 
that the initial response by the officer was excellent. They were prompt, they were um, gathered the basic information, um, they got the victim you know, to where they needed to be for the interview if they were wanting to do that. It was just a really great initial response. And so that theme presented early and consistently. So one thing to, to really um, get the team into this is really to have them present and work on what they're seeing as themes because that's going to be really helpful when you go into your findings and recommendations. Um, so each day we would have them present that and then at the end of our three days together um, I kind of put all that information together and really went through all of it with the team, you know, bullet point by bullet point to find out is this still a really a theme that we're seeing and does this fit here. Um, and so it was a really great way to um, kind of focus on what they were finding. Um, so what we did is we took all those themes, came back to Minnesota, and we, um, we started documenting and going through all those individual observation forms, and we made an, a ginormous spreadsheet in Excel and really started looking at where are we seeing a lot of uh, similarities. Um, and so we started, we started documenting those and developing those. Um, and in, in, our, in our three sites that we did this in, SVGI did all of the developing of the recommendations. Um, the SART team really didn't have to do much with that. Um, in the toolkit, I'm gonna, we're going to give you a way for the SART team to really come up with some of the recommendations. Um, but this might be the time where you look to someone that has an evaluation background on the team or you pose a question to the team of who would be interested in kind of tabulating all these findings and looking at some themes that you're seeing and looking at um, how that correlates with what are the best practices that we're seeing out there. Um, you can definitely talk with the team about like this is our protocol, this is our theme, these are lining up, that's awesome, you know, that's, that's something we want to keep going. So like with that one site when law enforcement was, their initial response was great. Um, you know, that was something that we definitely put in the report of the law enforcement's initial response is just is top notch, so keep doing what you're doing there. And I think that's one thing really too important is you need to also highlight some of the good things that you're seeing. I know I've said that before, but I don't think I can say that enough. Um, so yeah, who's responsible for developing them? It really depends on what your team has, has for strengths within your team. Um, and how and to whom are the findings and the recommendations presented. Like I said, we presented them to the law enforcement. We gave them a report that we had that was probably, I think, 10 to 15 pages, I think, and then it had an appendix of different resources. Um, like in one of the sites, we talked about suspect exams and how that would really help out um, in their investigations. And then we linked it to a, a, a report that we had found or that we had created about suspect exams and how, how to do them and how they can be beneficial. Um, so we shared that with law enforcement. We gave them a week or two or two weeks to review it, and then we came back and kind of discussed um, what they had questions on it or what they had for thoughts on it. Um, and then they were, you know, we kind of suggested these are things in the report that you can implement, um, or these are things that maybe you can bring to the SARTS team's attention that they can work on, because the one wonderful thing about case file review is you're going to go in with some questions you're going to maybe answer some of them, but you're going to come out with a lot more questions of a lot of great options of, of avenues that the team can go, different projects they can work on. Um, so it's maybe a matter of bringing it to the team about like how do we want to implement these changes. So like with that one team where the, the victim experienced silence when the case file went from law enforcement to prosecution, it was just a conversation within the team about this is what we're seeing. And to be real honest, this was a pretty easy way, a pretty easy thing that they can make a change with. Um, so they, the county attorney's office, prosecutor's office advocate took that on and kind of wrote up how they were going to respond um, so that the victims didn't experience silence. So it can be really simple like that. Um, some of them can be a little bit more, a little bit more difficult though. Okay, um, so like I've said, a toolkit is coming. Um, we have a few sections into OVW that they've approved. We're going to send in a few more here very shortly. I'm hoping by the end of the year the toolkit will be ready for dissemination across the U.S. Um, so for you all to have and see, um, try things out, see what's working and what's not working, um, and then let us know because we, we need to kind of understand where we need to change things at, where we need to um, keep doing some of the work at. Um, so that is coming. Um, hang on for it. And then I think that 
I think that is it. Um, my contact info is up there, my phone and email. Um, so feel free to email on call. We are going to have some time here, though, if you guys want to ask some questions. Um, Peter, if you would be so kind to unmute the lines if people want to ask any questions or chat them in as well. Yeah, if any of you have any questions, just um, in the control panel, there's a little raise your hand symbol or just type, I have a question, and I'll unmute your line in individually. We have one from, from the Wakasa. Cool. Crew here. Um, do you have suggestions or experience incorporating Priya into your starts? Um, me personally, no. Um, but we do have um, <clears throat> a member here at Mincasa that did some work with Priya. Um, but I don't know if our starts. Oh, actually, I would like to give you Leah Lutz's contact information. She is our SVJI program manager. Um, and she would be someone to connect with um, to ask questions about Priya. She's going to, I think, chat it out here to everyone, um, her email contact and, um, and possibly phone number as well. So good question. I don't know that I have the answer for it. Sorry. <laughs> Questions. If you do, go ahead and if you don't feel comfortable speaking or um, if you're not sure how to raise your hand, go ahead and uh, chat it into the chat box or into the question area that you had been using previously. We'll just give folks a few minutes to be able to do that. Okay, Jess, we do have a question, which is, uh, you know, if you have an officer that attends the meeting or a SANE nurse and you just have one officer or one SANE nurse and there's changes that you want to make, I know you discussed a little bit like, you know, what, what do you do next, but how does that information really get disseminated to the rest of the law enforcement officers or the rest of the SANE nurses and how can you really stay on top of that and get those protocols in place? And get those protocols in place? Okay. Um, so one thing we really talk about here with SVGI with um, SART teams is that the member on the team that represents law enforcement or the SANE organization, they have a responsibility to take what's going on with the team back to their home agency. So that law enforcement officer needs to take that information to his law enforcement and, and maybe talk about in roll call what, what's happening and what they're finding out. Um, and it could be a matter of the team, you know, writing up a quick fact sheet about this is something we identified, this is something we need to change. And they need to talk with their, their law enforcement supervisors to make sure that that becomes a priority. And I think through this process too, like with the coordinator, it's really important to start developing those relationships with the chief and with the head medical folks so that they understand the importance of this project, so there's some support for those team members that are going back to their home agencies and saying, this is what we found, this is what we need to do. Um, because people usually, um, if they feel a little bit more in the loop with what's going on, they're a little bit more willing to kind of support what's happening, or they feel comfortable reaching out to the coordinator and say, whoa, what's this about? Um, I, I don't know anything about this, and they can really connect on that. So um, another thing, too, we talk about with, with the team members is that when you're, when you're starting your SART or picking someone to be in a role on the SART, you want, some, you want a team member that 
you know, might be an informal leader on their team or they are in leadership so that they can really make some of those changes happen or they have the ear of someone that can make those changes happen. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. I feel like I should play some Jeopardy music or something. <laughs> okay, we have another question that just came in, uh, and it's how do you get initial buy-in to the case review process? How do you get initial buy-in? This, this, I love this question because I get it all the time. Um, there are some people on the team that want to do this, that have that desire, right? So I, I really say connect with those folks that have the passion for this and have the desire to do this work. Um, sometimes it's a matter of, of meeting with folks and trying to kind of maybe tap into some sales skills and really sell them on what they're going to get out of this. Specifically, like when I would talk with law enforcement, I'd say, you're going to learn so much about your case files. You're going to get this information. Um, and sometimes I found in this project that law enforcement and prosecution have um, – Sometimes it can be a hard relationship because there's that push pull and you know law enforcement wanting cases to go forward to prosecution, prosecution saying yes, but I need this information, and so it can be like this can give you the information you need to hopefully get your cases going further. So it's a matter of finding out what it is for that person or that agency that wants um, that is going to spark them to have that interest in doing this. So it's a really it's really looking for what is what is their what is their hook to get them into doing this. If that makes sense. Yes, and so then we also have a follow-up question that came in, which is, uh, how do you keep people involved and keep them active? Like, how do you keep that momentum going? <laughs> how to keep people involved and keep that momentum going? I giggle because sometimes, um, as a coordinator, you're kind of like the cheerleader, and you have to kind of um, get people more involved or excited about what's going on. So you kind of that's where that comes into that that focus and re reminding people of the focus and why you're doing this and maybe some storytelling as to why you're doing this and what you've seen um, that's that's happening that you need to you need to do some work with you need to look at and maybe do some change within the system. Um, I once I recently had a coordinator. Um, I'll give you two examples. Um, a coordinator was having a hard time with her team understanding how the response was not going well for victims when they were reporting a sexual assault crime. So she wrote up a skit, and she had everyone on the team draw numbers, and they had to act out a skit, which some people, that's really scary. Um, um, but it, what it did is it made them see what, what advocates were seeing in the response, and they go, oh, oh, dear Lord, we, we need to look at this. We need to take a, take a deeper look at what's going on. And so um, if you can do that kind of intermittently as your team's going through the case file review process, that kind of gets people excited to do the work. Um, another team um, was writing protocols, which can be like a year to a year and a half to two year process sometimes because the teams are meeting once a month for an hour and a half and they're reviewing what they've written for protocol. And so one coordinator would do is um, one, one month the team would present some protocols, everyone would review, ask questions, learn from it. And then the next month the coordinator would present some best practices that were emerging in the field and really have a, a excited kind of uh, jazz discussion with the team about how that would fit for their agency if they had that option. Um, specifically, one was on uh, the time frame for sexual assault exams. Um, the coordinator presented on how long um, how long are we doing exams for? Like, do we do we do 72 hours? Do we do 96? Do we do 120 hours after after an assault? Um, and the team had a really great conversation about the coordinator presented the what was happening um, that people are going more towards the 120 hours because they found research that suggests DNA can be found up to two weeks after a consensual relationship. And so they had a great conversation about it and, and that got the team really jazzed about, gosh, we should put that in our protocol. So that kind of was a little bit of the spark that said, okay, let's, let's get that in the protocol, right? So um, I hate to put that on the coordinator's shoulders, but sometimes it is, you know, bringing those little those little tidbits that gets the team excited, but but doesn't get them going off sh chasing after like a shiny object of something else other than what you're doing. All right. So then there's another question that came in in the chat box, and it says, "Can you go ahead without all core persons, such as if law enforcement or prosecution does not want to participate?" Um. 
It depends on whose case files you're reviewing. And so if you're reviewing law enforcement or prosecution case files and you want to go ahead without them, I'm really hesitant to that because um, they can, to be, to be blank or point blank, they can be, feel attacked. That maybe, um, you know, you're, you're doing it probably for good intentions, but they feel like, I said no, I don't want to do this. So you, it, it, could be, it could be detrimental. It could also maybe be beneficial, but I'm very hesitant of that myself. So, Thank you. yeah, yeah, <laughs> I understand the desire to do that. I really do. Um, and one thing that I should point out is um, in one of the sites we were talking with law enforcement about doing this, they were really on board to do this, um, but the prosecution wasn't. And so I said, well, that's fine. We can go ahead with, because we're going to view your case files. We're not looking at their information. And I offered to meet with the prosecution, um, and they just they didn't work for them or whatever. But they found out we are going ahead, so lo and behold, all the prosecutors from that office came to the trainings and the meetings and really got on board. And I think they came from a standpoint of concern that we were going to find something when we weren't even looking at their case files. So sometimes you, know, like you have to hold that tension point to some extent um, as well. So um, I guess that's, I can't really say what your specific situation is. If you want to chat with me later, give me a call. I'd, I'd love to talk through it with you. but. Um, you, you got to kind of weigh your pros and cons there, I guess. <laughs> Great question. I don't have any other questions that have come in. Okay. Um, well, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today and to let you all know that Peter will be emailing out the PowerPoint that was presented today. And the uh, webinar will also be in archive form for those that you may want to send this on to that were not able to join us today, maybe other members from your SART team. Uh, so that will be available on our website at WACASA. And also Peter will include that link in the email that gets sent out. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that we are having another webinar on December 14th at 10 AM. And that webinar is going to be the rollout of the CCR toolkit for the state of Wisconsin. And registration is now open on the Wakasa website, and we'll. I lost on that webinar on again December fourteenth. So thank you, everyone. Special thank you to Jess for supplying us with this information, and special thank you to Peter for being here for technical assistance. And everyone, have a great day. Thanks, everyone.